Great. So uh, my name is David Schmoyes, and I'll be talking about joint work with my current PhD student, Daniel Freund, my colleague, Shane Henderson, and completed PhD student supported by the first Comsas grant, Owen Omany. And uh, I'll be talking about a project that we've been doing for uh, about the last three years um, in providing algorithmic support for New York City's bike sharing company, uh, City Bike. So bike sharing systems are a growing feature of urban landscapes and a way of having an, a new element of, sustain, of a sustainable lifestyle uh, in urban transport. Um, the, the elements of a bike sharing system is that you have a map and a system of, of, of stations. Uh, at each station you have a collection of docks um, and uh, a fleet of bikes that can be rented. And the basic principle is that you can pick up a bike at any location within the system and uh, drop it off at any other location. Um, the uh, key element is uh, uh, a fab such as this, which allows you to release um, a bike from, from one of the docks. Um, you can look on your app to see where um, there is availability of bikes at a given station. Um, so as you can make your own usage decision. For New York City's bike sharing system, um, City Bike, it was initiated in May 2013. Just to give you a sense of the scale, um, there are more than a million rides a month. Last month there was 1.2 million. Um, over the last year, thinking about New York and variability of riding conditions, there were more than 10 million rides. Current state, if life is good, there are more than 7,000 bikes available in the system today for, for New York. There are a bit more than 400 stations, and this is all part of an ongoing ex expansion, which leads to interesting design questions. Um, and the group at Cornell, not just the people I mentioned, but, but uh, two groups of master students and, and a number of undergraduates have been working with City Bikes and uh, City Bike over the last several years, and, and the models and algorithms policies that, that, uh, that we've developed really inform day-to-day -day operations at City Bike um, as we speak. Um, and sort of one interesting thing is one of the ways that we got uh, uh, street cred in uh, helping them out in their initial crisis days um, started actually with uh, helping them route battery replacement service vehicles. Um, but really the current focus is how do we keep bikes where we need them and when we need them and how do we have good models for understanding that. So I thought what I'd do to give you a sense of a day in the life of the city is uh, um, show you a, a video uh, of traffic flow within the city. Before I start, press play. Um, what you're going to see at each station uh, is um, the net flow. Um, red will mean that they're more departing than arriving. Blue means that they're more arriving. The diameter is, uh, at a given station uh, reflects the number of bikes um, at, in a given 10-minute time interval. So I'm going to start the, the movie now. It's the, the time is indicated in the upper left-hand corner. It's, it's just after midnight. This is a city that never sleeps, so, uh, so that uh, you, you still see you know, flickers of, of activity. Uh, but it's, you know, it's only 5 a.m. Now life is coming up. The city is waking up. And not very surprising, you'll see you know, here um, in the financial district, you have bikes arriving. Here in the East Village, you have uh, bikes leaving. And, and so you have in Midtown, you see bikes arriving. And uh, you have this flow. And now it's calmed down. You have a little peak bursting up at lunchtime. Um, lunchtime exists, it calms down a bit. Now mid-afternoon. And then over a longer period, we have the afternoon rush now starting to go. And of course, it's gonna be the reverse, that, that now it's red in the financial district, it's blue in the East Village, um, as we have the bikes basically returning. Um, the evening rush hour lasts longer, um, it still goes till about eight, nine, depending on what time of year it is and how, li how late it stays light. And then we're back towards the end of the day and we're back towards midnight, things coming down. So you sort of see this, this daily flow of, of uh, this is a, a little bit old, that uh, it's just showing the, the footprint uh, as it was uh, a little bit more than a year ago. And of course, one of the nice things that a system like this is it monitors itself. We know the system state for any given station. Here's a pretty unused station in Brooklyn uh, that, uh, the green line indicates that there's a capacity of a bit more than 60 bikes, that's how many docks there are, and, and we see just throughout the time of day how many bikes there actually were at that given station. Okay, and this is one day. If you look at the same station in multiple days across the same week, we see not very different behavior. 
Contrast that to a much more intense station in Midtown, uh, where you see you know, tremendous use throughout the day. Some of those spikes are actually caused by rebalancing, that the ability to ingest, you know, the, the truck arrives, we, we unload a, a, a collection of 40 bikes, and of course then the current levels go way up, but then they may be completely depleted away by, by essentially instantaneous demand uh, being used. And you sort of see again that although day-to-day -day variability is the same sort of larger picture is not so different. You know, if I look at it from 3,000 feet, it's not so different. If I look at it from close up, then of course you see minute to minute variability. Um, here's sort of maybe a more typical picture. You sort of see very much uh, one kind of behavior is going in the morning rush hour, one kind of behavior is going in the afternoon rush hour. Uh, and, but one thing that is true about this is you know, common in all kinds of inventory management problems that you know the things that did happen, but you don't know the things that didn't happen. In particular, if there weren't bikes, you don't know who didn't rent because there weren't bikes there to rent. So this is a notion we think of as censored data, but here's a way in that we can take exploit the variability in order to actually understand better estimates of what the true demand functions were. So here, I want you to read this plot as from left to right, this is the 24-hour day cycle, and these are days in a given month. Each sort of sort of stripe across is one different day. The uh, red coding means we're out of docks. The deep blue means we're out of out of out of bikes. Green means basically things okay. I can understand the demand if I condition on as I look at a given slice of day, a given particular time interval, if I just condition on when I actually had availability either of bikes or docks, by conditioning on, on just that fraction I can get a better estimate of what the true demand is of when I actually have availability. And because there is the variability of when I actually have outages, I can then get better estimates of what's true in, a, across time. In trying to build models for how many bikes, if I think about sort of a limited planning session, it's the start of the morning rush hour, how many bikes should I have in a given station so as to cope with that demand? Is it a more like Midtown station where it's going to be bikes are coming in? If it's a more like the East Village where residents are going out, how do I understand and how do I model what the right number of bikes that we're going to have at a given station? Um, the approach that we took is to model this with a continuous time Markov chain and the objective function that we're trying to capture is just to count the expected number of upset people. People who try to dock a bike and there are no docks and people who try to rent a bike but there are no bikes. Um, and we can think about this as uh, each station having its own exogenous renting and, and returning rates, lambda for renting, uh, mu for returning. Let's assume for now that they're constant as I think about the cross through a rush hour. Um, and then I'm going to have a cost function as a function of the number of bikes I that are initially in uh, my, uh, at my station, what's the expected cost over the period of that rush hour in terms of the number of up ex expected number of customers. And if you plot that, you, you know, quickly come to the conclusion that this is actually a convex function. And so now I can think about the allocation problem as follows. I have a fleet of bikes total number of bikes and I'm going to have to allocate them to the stations across and I want to minimize that cost function system wide. And so, and this is something we can do and, and, and solve, but we can also view this as part of a planning problem. That if you look at, for each station I have a capacity that how many docks do I have avail available, the, the bike allocation has to be between zero and, the, and that, that capacity. Uh, but. Uh, Rather than thinking of that as an input, I can also think of that as a design variable, and now I'm going to have a budget of docks, and that's going to give me an allocation problem of how do I design both bikes and docks um, throughout the system. Um, that's not such a, there's, there's somewhat less strong properties about that, but nonetheless this gives us a means of sort of trying to understand here's the system as it is, here's the system as it might be better designed, and we can see that one of the ways in which life is better is that, that we, we would really want to have, for example, more docks in Midtown than, and, and more docks in the financial district. Now, this was all based on the modeling assumption that uh, uh, we had constant rates of renting and, and arriving. Let's see, and I said it sort of con, you know, compactly, let's say over the morning rush. But if you look at that plot, you'll see that that's not such a well-founded assumption, right? That if I look at the period up till 8 a.m., we have a great inflow of bikes, but between 8 and 10, all of a sudden we have a great outflow of bikes. Now, this actually happens to be outside Bellevue Hospital, and that's the reason why uh, you see that thing, probably, that uh, you have uh, 
arrival of staff and, and departure of staff with a staff change at eight. So now, of course, we're going to be interested in extending the model and thinking about doing analogous setups when we have both time, uh, when we have time dependent uh, arrival and rental rates. And all I'm going to say about this is point you to a lightning talk this afternoon in a poster of, of Daniel Freund, uh, my current PhD student, who's going to talk about um, work for, for the analogous questions that arise in that setting as well. Of course, one of the issues that now I'm, I, I've talked mostly up till now about just how do I think about good planning models for what's the right allocation of how many bikes should be at a given station at a given time, but we do have some resources to move bikes around both within the rush hour and, and, and overnight in that quiescent period between midnight and, and 6 a.m. Uh, one of the means that happens during rush hour, if you look at that picture to the right, um, next to me, that's Owen, uh, who finished his PhD a year ago and has now moved from two wheels to four at Uber. Um, and uh, um, that uh, this trailer is a means for moving a, a, f a collection of bikes, in this case five, that can be loaded onto that trailer, and that shuttles back and forth. Because one of the properties of New York City is that you have both close by stations, one where there's a saturation of bikes, and one where there's a starvation of bikes. And so we can schedule through the rush hour without worrying about getting through rush hour traffic, so this uh, trailer to go back and forth. And this is, you know, so here we might have a pair of stations like this, and, and the question is, I give you a limited number of trailers. I now have an, an interesting optimization modeling and, and algorithmic question, and it can be handled in a variety of ways. So how do I allocate uh, a limited number of trailers so as to, to, to have the greatest effect possible? Um, so, so you might have a, an, an allocation that looks something like that. Um, overnight, uh, we have a different problem. We have a, a basically a six hour period, uh, and we have a collection of, of stations. Some are, have too many bikes, some have too few bikes, and now we're going to have to figure out a good routing. Initially, um, the, 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 the crews weren't um, so well trained, and we actually had to sort of give simple instructions that we wanted sort of full truck, that they take a 22 bike capacity uh, uh, truck, and it would simply alternate between picking up just bikes from a given station, filling the truck, going to another station, leave them all there. And this gave rise to an interesting vehicle routing problem that allowed us to uh, um, better balance the system. Today, we're working on, 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 on much more refined tools to do that instead. So that's the kind of routes that you might see there. Um, one of the you know, ironies of, of this system is that unlike Tel Aviv, where bike sharing system is on the grid, in New York, it's run on solar power. Uh, solar power means it's really run by batteries that somewhat recharge. And here you can see plots of voltage levels at uh, um, stations throughout the system. And one of the things that you can do in sort of easy machine learning style kinds of techniques is delineate when actually the batteries were, were, act were replaced as part of, of, as part of that system. Um, and uh, one of the questions that we're working on as well is thinking about how do I then combine this stochastic information about the need to replace with the, the scheduling of uh, um, replacing the batteries. So this gives you a sense of the range of the kinds of operational questions that come into providing support for a bike sharing system. One of the nice things is that the data is all there. The system collects its own operational state and that, that it allows us to build tools that allow the management of the system throughout. And now I'll take questions. So you showed one heat map that uh, the graph essentially showed uh, the number of bikes that are left or number of dogs that are left to park the bikes. So clearly, uh, if I'm the person who is managing this uh, bike sharing scheme, my aim is to have high utilization. But at the same time, uh, I want to make sure that if I'm not able to serve my customers, I should be able to satisfy that as well. So are you taking into economics of like, CapEx, like buying new bikes and also like provisioning them? Currently, we're dealing without, the, I mean, the, the, the capital investment is really determined by the powers that be. And we're just dealing with, with, with managing the, the resources that are in place. But it's, it's certainly an interesting question. I mean, that, 
Uh, I mean, one of the things that we did for them was as they were thinking about expanding in their system in the Bay Area, which is going from 700 bikes to 7,000 bikes, you know, how do you estimate whether, you know, what the, what the number of subscribers is going to be? How are you going to estimate the number of trips? And different systems with different footprints are going to have, you know, really different behaviors. And you see this, you know, across the system and having a way of, of, of building the forecast. I mean, there, there are talks uh, of building, expanding the system, city system where it's currently in Manhattan and a little footprint in Brooklyn and Queens to being all five borough wide and, and more than almost quintupling the number of bikes in the system. How do you figure out how, you know, how do you build good demand forecasts so as to know what the right resources that you're going to have to understand what behavior. And of course, this is cyclical. The number of people using the system and willing to be subscriber is a function of the perceived availability. Um, there's nothing, you know, if you, I walk by that station and I see it's always empty at the time that I'm there, I'm not going to be incentivized to actually, you know, become a subscriber. And how do you actually manage that? Nicole. Demand by offering different pricing schedules. So this is a great question. So unfortunately, the New York City system is a uh, based primarily on a subscriber all you can eat. We've in introduced a what they're called bike angels, which is an incentive scheme, which is in effect introducing an alternative, you know, alternate currency by means of cash, pri cash, and 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 various other prizes. Um, so as to try to incentivize people to sort of swim upstream and, and, and to also just slightly shift demand. And we think there's great potential in, 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 in taking that direction and actually implementing ways in which and this is ongoing. There are pilots going on as we speak um, to do that. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.